Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. I hope that you've had a good week so far and that you are ready and excited about the fact that we're almost finished the week and it's almost weekend again. Um, so in this lesson, we're going to be talking about a sub subject or a chapter section of the grade 10 science. It's got a really strange name. It's particles of which substances are made of. That's what it's called. Particles of which substances are made of. It's a very strange name for the section, but what they're really trying to say is that we need to talk about what makes up substances, okay? So we kind of know this stuff already, but we need to go through it anyway to make sure that you haven't missed anything from previous years. So let's talk about elements and atoms, okay? All substances are made up of the most simple particles, which are atoms, okay? Now, I know, I know that you guys know about atoms, and I know that you guys know that atoms aren't the smallest things out there, okay? I know that you guys know that atoms are made up of nuclei that have got protons in them and neutrons in them and that you've got little electrons, okay? But to make it easy for you to understand what's going on, you need to remember that the substances are made up of these simple particles called atoms. And I know that some of you might even know about things like quarks and flavors and that which are even smaller than protons and neutrons that are found in the nucleus, okay? So don't stress about that. We're just going to break it down to atoms and then work up from there, okay? So we're just doing this simplistically and we're starting at atoms, okay? So all substances are made up of the particles which we call atoms. All elements are made up of individual atoms in which with all the atoms of a particular element having the same structure, they can't be broken up into simpler substances. And what we mean by that is even though we know that an atom um, can give off electrons. So yeah, for example, as an atom and it's got a proton and let's say it's got a neutron and let's say it's got one electron in its outer energy shell that's going around. Okay, and I'm just drawing a circle around it so you can see it. Okay, so now we cannot break that up without changing the actual element. Okay, you can, and there are elements called radioactive elements that do actually break up and give off protons and change the nature of themselves. Okay, but most atoms, most elements, um, if you had to change, the break this up, you would have to do what is called nuclear fission. Okay, which is the same as a nuclear bomb. So in other words, huge, huge amounts of energy, huge amounts of energy in for that reaction to happen. And then huge amounts of energy is given off when that happens. So what we're trying to say is normally when we're talking about normal reactions with everyday elements and that, what we're saying is that the atoms do not break down into simpler substances. Okay, so all elements are made up of these basic building blocks, which are the atoms. Okay, let's move on. The noble gases are the only substances that exist as single separate atoms in nature. Okay, so even for example, your group seven elements like to be diatomic. In other words, they like to be in nature as a pair. So you've got, for example, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, acetine, Okay, but they aren't the only ones. I mean, there's nitrogen, which likes to be in nature as a pair. There's oxygen, there's hydrogen. Okay, the noble gases, the only substance that exists as single separate atoms in nature because they, all other atoms are joined to other atoms, either of the same kind or, or of a different kind. Okay, because even if you think about metals, metals are joined up with other metallic atoms, okay, to form a metal lattice. So it's not exactly like the metal isn't joining up or just being by itself, okay. So you need to understand the noble gases because they are so perfect in their, um, in their atomic structure are the only substances that exist as single separate 
atoms in nature. So what do the atoms do? The atoms join or, or combine to form what is called a compound. Okay, so atoms of different elements combine in a chemical reaction and then compounds are formed. So, and the reason I'm mentioning this chemical reaction is because we're going to talk a little bit about physical changes and chemical changes a bit later, either today in this lesson or in the next lesson. So when atoms of different elements combine in a chemical reaction, compounds are formed and they consist of two or more atoms of different or oh, type of different elements. Okay. Compounds consist of a group of two or more different atoms in a definite specific ratios. Oh my word, what was going on with the typing ratios? My apologies. Okay, so what are we saying about that? We are saying that if, for example, we know that water, water is always made with two hydrogens and one oxygen. If we had to suddenly change that ratio, so it becomes H2O2, for example, so now there's two hydrogens for every two oxygens, then what is actually happening there is that we're actually changing the substance. And that substance there is actually called peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, which is fatal to us, okay? If we had to drink hydrogen peroxide, we would die. I know that there's some people out there who believe that if you drink hydrogen peroxide, it's good for you. It's very small amounts, obviously. But actually, if you had to drink hydrogen peroxide that is concentrated, you will die. Um, whereas water is life sustaining on earth. We need water in order to survive. So you can see that it's very important that we have the correct ratio of elements above atoms to make the specific element that I mean specific molecule that we're going for okay so in other words if I want to talk about water I need to know that there are two hydrogens for every oxygen two hydrogens for every oxygen compounds may be broken down into simpler, simpler substances by chemical means so there is a way for compounds to be broken down into the simpler substances by chemical means and we'll talk about the difference between um, physical and chemical means a little bit later particles of compounds exist as molecules or ions and that depends on the type of bonds formed okay so whether it's a covalent bond or ionic bond will determine whether or not the particles that the compound breaks up into are molecules or ions so there are two types of compounds and it's very important that you guys know both these types of compounds the first are the part of the molecular compounds molecular compounds now molecular compounds have individual molecules okay they are held together by intermolecular forces or bonds and the examples are water ammonia carbon dioxide and methane okay so what you need to understand is Basically, your compound is made up of molecules and it doesn't matter if you have um, tons of water or a little bit of water. You're, when we look at the compound, you will see it's made up of a molecule, which is an oxygen and two hydrogens, for example. Just to give you a difference of showing you what the difference is, ionic compounds are made up of giant crystal lattices. Okay, so that's the difference. So the two types are molecular compounds and ionic compounds. Now molecular compounds are individual molecules. Okay, so in other words, water is made up not of a crystal lattice of oxygen and hydrogen, but of individual water molecules okay which will either move very far past and with lots of speed if they are an um if they are a gas or they'll be very close together with very little amount of speed if they are solid but the point is that they are definitely molecules and they are definitely inter 
um, individual molecules. They are held together by intermolecular forces and bonds. So what's holding water molecules together is actually hydrogen bonding. Um, and same with ammonia and methane. And what you need to understand is that these are very weak forces that are found between the molecules. Very weak forces found between the molecules. Right, now let's talk about ionic compounds. Ionic compounds occur when you've got positive and negative ions that are held together in a crystal lattice. So if you look over here, we've got two different examples. The one is sodium chloride. Now sodium chloride is table salt and we seem to talk about it a lot. I don't know if you've noticed, but we talk about sodium chloride a lot. And the reason is because it's the iconic um, ionic <laughs> crystal lattice compound, okay? In other words, if I wanted to talk to you and explain to you about a specific crystal lattice or a specific ionic compound, I would talk about table salt because it is the one that is works perfectly. It obeys all the rules beautifully um, and there's no doubt that it will actually obey all the rules and make it all perfect okay so that's why we use table salt um, which you do need to know is sodium chloride okay so the whole point about this is that these are held together by, by electrostatic forces okay so if we go back to the molecular compounds and we are going to talk about hydrogen bonding and um, other types of forces later but what happens is these three here, the water, the ammonia, and the methane, are held together by what is called hydrogen bonding. Okay? Hydro oh, hydrogen bonding. And what we are saying is that you need to have, the hydrogen is bonded with the oxygen, but this hydrogen bonding, even though it's called bonding, it's a misnomer. What's a misnomer? A misnomer is something that's being incorrectly named. Okay, nomo means to name something. Misnomer is something that is incorrectly named. So a bond is that is not a bond would be incorrectly named. For example, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is actually an intermolecular force. It is something that is very weak and it happens between the molecules. Between the molecules. So in other words, you've got a bond here. This is actually a proper bond. Yeah, from water to the oxygen to the hydrogen to the proper bond, from the oxygen to the hydrogen to the proper bond. Those are bonds and they are covalent bonds, okay? But if I had to draw one water molecule, okay, I'm drawing slightly differently. Here's my oxygen and two hydrogens. And another water molecule with my oxygen and two hydrogens. These are held together by very weak hydrogen bonds okay but they're called bonds incorrectly they should be called a hydrogen force but nowadays they call them bonds so bonds it is okay so this is what's going on with the molecular compounds so in other words if i had to look at this under microscope i would see individual molecules of water individual molecules of ammonia okay whereas with ionic compounds we don't have an individual anything. If I looked at under the microscope, this is more or less what I'd see. You wouldn't see the little lines. That's just, just give you an idea of how far apart they are and how they're connected. But what you would see are molecules that are arranged in a beautiful crystal lattice. Okay. Typical examples of your ionic compounds are sodium chloride, copper sulfate, lead nitrate, and potassium permanganate. Um, and this is just another example of an ionic compound in its crystal shape. And you'll notice that it's kind of looking 3D, okay, because it is. And this is going out of the cube. So the cube has basically mapped out a specific space, okay. And then you'll notice that this one here is going out. And please remember that this is three dimensional, okay? So these aren't exactly in line. This isn't a front. This is, these two are in line with each other. This is towards the back, okay? Please remember that. Okay. So now let's talk about the types of bonding. So we just, just 
illustrated the difference between intermolecular and intramolecular. Okay, now intermolecular is between the molecules. Okay, so we spoke about that and we said that there was hydrogen bonding and there were, I didn't mention it, but it is weak van der Waals forces, we're going to talk about it later, and weak London forces. Okay, so there are three types of, well, there are lots of types of intermolecular forces and we will go through all of them. Okay, we'll, we'll go through all the that you need to know. But there are three types of bonding which you guys know about. The one is covalent bonding, the next is ionic bonding, and the third is metallic bonding. So now let's talk about covalent bonding. Now you guys should know this. You should have been taught this already this year, if not last year. That covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons. Okay, it's the sharing of electrons. So let me explain it to you this way. Let's say you got one atom here. Okay, and let's say you've got a second atom over here. Okay, what you need to understand, now remember that these colored in lines that I've drawn here, the red and the blue, I'm drawing it rough because they are orbitals. They are orbitals. And what are orbitals? Orbitals are where you are most likely to find an electron most likely to find an electron so that's what an orbital is it's like i want you to think of it as if you are flying in the sky in an airplane okay there's no direct path okay i know that the pilots plot plot a path they say okay fine we're going to travel i don't know northeast from cape town to Joburg, but they don't there's no like line it's not like a road on the ground okay so that's kind of what an orbital is in space you've got an area Area where you're most likely to find your electron. Now the same with the planet's um, flight path. If they're going along and suddenly some other random airplane decides to just fly into their path, then obviously they're going to have to move out of their path. Or if there's really bad weather, then they might have to deviate and they might they'll still be on their general path, but they will be slightly out of their original plan. Okay, so if you want to think about it this way, and I'm going to just draw it big, is that if you've got that this is your atom, and let's say that this is your orbital. Now, remember that this is three-dimensional. Obviously, I can't draw this three-dimensionally. But what can happen is your electron is can be found somewhere in this orbital, but we're not sure where. So you need to understand that it can travel along here and out there and through there and then go out far and then come in and then go out and then maybe go like this and then carry on so you can see where the shape comes we know whenever they draw like atoms in this in the movies or whatever and you can see they draw this kind of like shape this is where they're getting it from from the fact that these orbitals that you don't know where the electrons are going to be they're just going to be more or less in this area and we don't know exactly where it's going to be okay so um Okay, so that is an orbital. Okay, so now what happens is if you've got two atoms that have got overlapping orbitals, they may have a sharing of electrons. And if they have a sharing of electrons, we call this covalent bonding. But then what happens is, uh, let me just draw another atom, quite a big one. Okay, so your electron, your covalent bonding depends on your electronegativity. Okay, so in other words, an electronegativity is a measure of how strongly an atom holds on to its electrons. So if you've got a very high electronegativity, it means you're going to hold on to your atoms very strongly. Whereas if you've got a very low electronegativity, it means you don't hold on very strongly at all. But with covalent bonding, these two atoms actually have more or less the same electronegativity. They kind of kind of hold on to the electrons with kind of the same amount 
of energy. Okay, so what would happen then, and remember this is three-dimensional and I can't draw three-dimensional, is that when there is a sharing of electrons, let's say for example this one on the left-hand side has got slightly more electrons than the one on the right, it will share its electrons so that these electrons will go around both of them. Okay, do you understand that? They will go around both of them. So they may even do that which I doubt, but the point is that they can go around both of them and they are, and that's what's happening with the sharing of electron pairs, is that these electrons actually, in fact they won't do the little thing, they're going to keep going around like this, so they're going to go around both of them now, okay, do you understand that? So this mostly occurs between non-metals and other non-metals, okay? And often between the diatomic molecules, or well, the diatomic molecules can't have any other type of bonding, so therefore it has to be covalent bonding. But what they're trying to say to you is that if you were looking for an example of covalent bonding, you could say the diatomic molecules. And examples of molecules that have covalent bonding are water and chlorine. Okay, those are just two examples of the many atoms that have covalent bonding. Now let's talk about, oh, yo, I apologize, ionic bonding, ionic bonding. So let's talk a little bit about ionic bonding. I'm going to raise it all and then I'll fix this again. Bonding, bonding. Sorry. Okay, what happens to the ionic bonding is the one atom holds on to the electrons or attracts electrons much more strongly than the other one. If you want to get technical, we're talking about electronegativity again, the one atom has got a way higher electronegativity than the other one, okay? So let's say, for example, you have got two atoms here. Okay, so here's the one atom, and let's say that this is the other atom. And let us pretend that this dude here has got this bigger electronegativity, it's just stronger. Okay, it's got stronger electronegativity. Okay, so what that means is that they're still going to share electrons, okay, but the electron is going to spend way more time around this atom, the one with the stronger electronegativity, than around this one. So it's going to go zoops. Okay, um, I think we're back on, I'm not sure. Okay, so the point is that what you need to think about is that if, for example, you are married, okay, you share your stuff, okay, but when you divorce or when you break up with someone, one of the people might end up with way more stuff than the other person, okay, and that's kind of what's happening, okay, is that the, the one with the high electronegativity is the one that's keeping all the stuff, whereas the other person is giving it away. So in other words, examples, oopsie, wrong way.
Right, sorry about that. For some reason we got lost, um, Skype lost us. So let's carry on. Um, so what you have to think about with the ionic bonding is there's a transfer of electrons. Um, so I know I said at the time that there isn't really a transfer because the electrons will travel way longer around there. The transfer of electrons actually comes um, when the electrons are actually separated out. So ions are formed and this is usually between metals and non-metals and you end up with positive and negative ions being formed. For example, your sodium potassium, sodium chloride and potassium fluoride. Now let's talk about metallic bonding. In metallic bonding you've got a positive ions are surrounded in a sea of delocalized electrons. And of course, these with always within metals. For example, sodium, copper, potassium. Right, it is important that the type of bonds determine the physical and chemical properties. Important that you know that. That the type of bonds determine the physical and chemical properties of the substances. So before we carry on, we want to be a bit more specific about covalent bonding. So covalent bonding, as we mentioned before, is, a, is the sharing of electrons. So if you had to have two hydrogen atoms join, you can see that hydrogen has got one electron in its outer energy shell and hydrogen molecules got two, I mean, so each of but in order for this to become like a noble gas, it would like to have two electrons in its outer energy shell, so therefore they're going to join and they're going to share those two electrons, okay? Now, if you look at fluorine, fluorine is in group seven, so we expect it to have seven valence electrons. So we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and similarly one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So when they join up, if you look at the left hand side fluorine, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you look at the right hand side fluorine, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So therefore both of these fluorines have now got um, the right number. I mean they've now got complete full octet um, out of shells. So that is why they bond and they form F2. Okay, and this is H2 by the way. Now let's look at carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an interesting one because carbon has got four valence electrons. One, two, three, four. Oxygen has got six, but this is badly drawn. The way you should draw the oxygen is if you use your oxygen. Remember, you always write in your two valence electrons, the initial two valence electrons, which are from the first energy shell, and then it goes three, four five, six. And if you draw it like that, you can see that we've got a space over here and a space over here. Okay, so if we had to then join it up with carbon, the way we would do it is, I'm going to run out of space if I draw it there, so let me just erase link and draw it rather over here. So I'm going to do oxygen over here and I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, and six. So you can see that there is a space over here and the space over here. So if I put my carbon in here and I go one, two, because that would be the side and the top, three, four, then do you see that I could then put my oxygen over here and I'd have one, two, and then three, four, five, six. And you'll see it's a linear molecule. So please be careful about not drawing your stuff like that, okay? The carbon is correct, but the oxygen, please be careful how you draw it. Okay, now let's talk ionic bond. Okay, wait, sorry, I forgot something. So that's your carbon dioxide, and you'll and notice that you've got two double bonds. This here is a double bond because there are two um, electrons coming from the oxygen and two electrons coming from the uh, a carbon and similarly this is a second double bond. So we would write this as C double bonded O double bonded O. That's how we would write it in Cooper notation, right? Okay, now let's look at fluoro 
a, a fluorine, four fluorines and a carbon. So you've got one carbon with its four electrons in its outer energy shell. And then you've got the four fluorines that join up. So therefore, you've got what is called carbon tetrafluoride. It's a carbon. There are fluorides around it, surrounding it, but there are four of them. So if there are four of them, it means that it's tetrafluoride. Okay, so these are examples of covalent bonding. Now let's talk ionic bond. Remember what we said, ionic bond is the transfer of electrons. It's when you have one atom that holds on to electrons much more strongly than another atom. So these, when metals lose their electrons to non-metals, positive and negative ions are formed. Okay, obviously because of the transfer of electrons. So the electron might have gone from one place to place B. So then the first place is now going to be positively charged because we've lost an electron. And place B is going to be negatively charged because we've got an extra electron. The ions hold together with electrostatic force of attraction called ionic bonds. Okay, so you need to understand that ionic bonds are actually an example of an electrostatic force. They're pretty strong and many ions are held together in a giant crystal lattice, okay, which we have seen before. So an example would be sodium chloride where you've got a giant crystal lattice um, between the sodium and chloride atoms. Okay, so here's a little video of metallic bonding. Now remember what we said, we said that metallic bonding is said to be positive um, nuclei surrounded by C of delocalized electrons. Okay, so if you have a look at it, you can see that these electrons are flowing around the atom any way they want, okay? This is a sea of delocalized electrons. There are movements of the electrons are random, but if we put a charge across it, they're obviously going to move towards the positive pole and away from the negative pole because the direction of your electrons is always from negative to positive. Okay, now let's talk about ionic bonding. What happens is the metals lose their outer electrons to non-metals, okay? So in order for that to happen, an atom, if it loses an electron, it becomes positively charged. It becomes a positive ion. If it gains an electron, then it becomes a negative ion. So then we have what is called electrostatic forces. Okay, or Coulomb forces. And since something is positive and that thing is negative, what do we have? We have a force of attraction. So we end up having an electrostatic or Coulomb force of attraction between the two ions. And this is called ionic bonding. And these bonds are really strong. In fact, they're the strongest when it comes to chemical bonding. And finally, it says many ions are held together in a giant crystal lattice, which we knew anyway. Why am I talking? Okay, then. Um, now we're going to talk about inter and intramolecular forces. Okay, so the difference between inter and intra, I want you to think about if you are watching this, you are watching it via the internet, okay, or as some people you like to call the interweb, but you're watching it via the internet, okay. You are not sitting in the same building as me and you look you're watching trust me i know you're not okay you're not sitting in the same building as me um watching the program i mean or the lesson using the same server okay what is happening is that you are sitting somewhere very far away um or next door and you are using a different internet server to watch it okay so what is the difference inter inter means you're across the internet from me so in other words that would be like at least one um i wouldn't say building um i would say one one institution away the reason i wouldn't say building is because if you go to a big university then they have what is called their own intranet now what is an intranet an intranet is one which 
Okay, let me explain it to you this way. If, say, for example, I'm sitting in an office, okay, and I want to send an email to Bob, who's sitting on the other side of the office. Now, I could use the internet and send that email or that information to him and his computer using the internet. But just now there's something wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with the internet or it's just down, the server's down or whatever. Then do you realize it's actually going to be um, quite slow? But what I could do is use the intranet, um, which means that the message is going straight from my laptop to his laptop. It's not going from my laptop through to a satellite, to a to an antenna, through to a satellite dish, through to a satellite and back again, okay? What is happening is it's going straight through some wires from my computer to his computer, okay? So the difference again between inter and intra is inter is between and intra is within. Okay, so forces between atoms within the molecules are called chemical bonds. For example, your ionic or covalent bonds. And these are called, um, okay, the bonds within the molecules are called intramolecular forces. So they ask you to talk about intramolecular forces. We're talking about ionic, covalent, and metallic bonding. If we're talking about intermolecular forces, we're talking about the forces between the molecules. Right. So examples of forces between the molecules are your hydrogen bonding, your Fanovars forces, your London's forces, etc. Okay, so that's the difference between them. So over here we have a picture of a whole bunch of different molecules. So in the first one we've got what looks like water. Okay, and you'll see that we've got sodium and we've got positive sorry, positive ions on the outside and negative ion in the middle. And you can see that there are forces between the molecules. So these, all these atoms within this big compound molecule have basically been attracted to the sodium plus ion, okay, by an intermolecular force. Okay, you know what? I'm actually going to, my thing's gone off again. So I'm going to stop now and we will carry on with this lesson at this point here on today is Thursday, on Tuesday. Have a great day. Cheers.